Here we go. Now, let's try this again. <clears throat> so again, welcome everyone. So what to expect this evening, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to Wander Ground. I know many of you already know a good deal about us, but I'll just repeat a little bit of it again uh, for those of you who may be new to joining us. And then we're going to take a peek into the archives. Uh, mostly everything in that, that I'll be showing is specifically from the New England region. And then I will try to leave enough time at the end so that you all may share your stories or memories or ask questions or contribute to the conversation. That would be very much appreciative if you would do that. So uh, basically, Wanderground is a lesbian-focused archive library. So everything that we have in here is got something to do with lesbians. Um, so we have a broader range of publications and audiovisuals, artifacts, ephemera, personal memorabilia, all kinds of things. Right now, mostly it's a private collection, most things that I've collected over the last 40 years. But slowly, I am um, getting donors who have been giving us materials. Kathy Lewis is here, and she's given me quite a bit of stuff that some of it you will see this evening and others have been uh, sharing information with me as well. But mostly the collection focuses on the New England region, even though there is a fair amount of national and international items in the collection. Oh my goodness, why is this doing this to me? Uh-oh, hold on. Oh dear. I forgot how touchy this mouse is. Okay. And ultimately, we will um, have a lot of gathering space. Right now, everything is in the house, but we are trying to find a space so that you can visit it. More people can come visit it, see what we're doing, and so that we have some more workspace because we have several individuals who have expressed an interest in participating in working with the collection, but we work elbow to elbow in a very tight space, and we're trying to make it so that more people can come. So everything that I am showing this evening is actually currently in our collection. And I'm hoping that over the course of the evening, you'll say, where's this? Where's that? Tell me. And I will want you to tell me where, what you know about that I may have missed. So I showed this because I'm so, I get so excited about talking about this stuff. So I'm really going to try, like I said, to keep it to 30 minutes and leave plenty of time for um, conversation. And I had a really hard time trying to keep this to uh, not show everything in our collection, but to show enough to get you as excited about it as I am. So the first section I'm going to focus on is lesbian words in print. Uh, so basically, these are regional contributors because we call it a library, and it is because we have a fair number of books and periodicals and printed materials, pamphlets, and um, chapbooks, and so on. So this basically is uh, some of the regional contributions to the women in print movement, which is the movement of feminist and lesbian publishers and bookstores who were able to make lesbian words available to all of us who were interested in them. So we're going to start off with the Amazon Quarterly, uh, which was in, created in Somerville, Mass., and it, it was a publication that included a lot of art and poetry, fiction, uh, some essays, some photos. Uh, they were only active from 72 to 75. And we have in our collection an incomplete set. We don't have everything from this particular publication. Uh, but every time I see a new one, I grab it. But these were a couple of the covers from the Amazon Quarterly. Trivia. Many of you might have seen that. That was also national in scope, but they came out of North, uh, North Amherst, Massachusetts from 82 until 95. And I've since realized, discovered that they actually have an online version. Uh, uh, the original publishers ceased creating the essays that uh, ceased creating trivia, but someone else had picked it up in 2004. And so you can go to the website that's called Trivia Voices and see some of the issues that they did. They're only online, they're not in print, but the original trivia was in print. And that was mostly um, theoretical opinion essays, a lot of radical feminist thought, 
um, experimental writing, uh, some creative, other creative writing as well. They did book reviews and so on and so forth. But it was it, it was a very compelling um, publication and Wander Brown has a complete set of that publication. There's also a lot of other little periodicals. These were also national in scope, but um, as you can see, the SEPs, the first one that's called Separatists Eroding Patriarchy, they came out of Greensboro, Vermont. Uh, for, I'm not entirely sure exactly of the years. I don't have a complete set of that, uh, but they, they uh, were basically handmade. You know, they typed it up themselves. All the pictures are hand drawn. There's nothing flashy about it, but it's basically a lot of separatist thought, a lot of articles, reviews, opinions. Um, commentaries, so on and so forth. Dyke's disability and stuff focused on um, disability issues primarily. Came out of Boston. I This is the only issue I have is this volume three, number one. I don't have any more information about them. I cannot find them anywhere. So if you happen to have copies of this, that would be really great to add to our collection if you have them. And then Lesbian for Lesbians, this is also, um, I think they were radical lesbian feminists to the most part. They, I put Massachusetts and Vermont because the editors were mostly writing out of Massachusetts, Boston, various locations out of Massachusetts, but it was mailed from Vermont. So I think that was probably a collective who was working on that. And as far as I know, their years were from 1989 to 1994. Again, very simply made, just uh, printed off, photocopied basically. Um, I don't know if it was mimeograph or what, but it's, you know, stapled together, sent in an envelope, very low cost for this one, nothing slick about it at all. Uh, then there's also a lot of periodicals that were also national in scope that had, that were not necessarily specifically lesbian, but had a lot of lesbian influences or editors or writers or articles of certainly feminist, um, but with a lot of lesbian inf influences. And Sojourner was primarily news. So they were reporting news from around the country, around the world, coming out of Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, in newspaper format, regular newspaper format. Woman of Power was, um, focusing mostly on feminism and spirituality. That one came out of Cambridge also. As you can see, a lot of these came out of Massachusetts. A lot going on up there in Massachusetts and New England. Uh, this, the woman of power was also, this happens to be a black and white cover that I happened to put my hand on, but they had a lot of full color, very colorful um, covers. Lots of, uh, mostly, I want to say, well, feminist spirituality, but mostly like, goddesses or nature, ecology, peace, uh, mindfulness, those kinds of things. They also did politics as well, uh, but very more of a, a spiritual bent to this particular publication. Rain and Thunder got started back in 1998. They were coming out of Northampton and they started off uh, again, a very low um, cost stapled uh, black and white publication that started in 1998, but over the years, they got a lot, a lot slicker. They had full color covers. They had, um, I think they had some color inside as well. Lots of articles. And I'm really, this issue that's, and we will rise actually featured an interview with me about Wanderground. That was in uh, January of 2023. And uh, sadly, I just got an email from them about a month ago saying that they had ceased publication. The thing about that I really liked about Rain and Thunder is that they had a lot of international news as well as national news and really um, having a lot of radical feminist thought as well. And then there's the local news. So these were a couple of, um, they weren't, they, they, were, they were really local uh, publications the lesbian position, I want to just say, is, is the newsletter, a lesbian position. And they were very clear to say that it was a lesbian position, so that they didn't want to say that they were the one true lesbian or anything like that. But they published for quite a long time. They came out monthly. The nice thing about 
a lesbian position that I really appreciated is I, I do have pretty much a full set of this publication. A lot of articles, a lot of letters, a lot of conversation, but it's one of those publications where you could really go issue by issue by issue and really see what was happening in New Haven and Connecticut in the broader Connecticut area during that time period, because it was very lively. There was arguments in the print, there were ads, there were um, from some stories and articles about what was happening in town. And I found it very entertaining to read it every month. I look forward to it when it came every month, uh, folded in half and stapled and sometimes in an envelope. But it really, if, if reading through that, you really get a sense of the community at that time and what was the conversation that was happening. The third wave um, was not a lesbian publication, but there were a lot of lesbians who were involved in it, but it was the local Rhode Island paper, had a lot of news and politics um, in it and other general stories about women and whatnot. There, there was some lesbian articles in there, not very many that I've seen in the few issues I've seen, but I do know that it was had a large, uh, many of the editors or writers were lesbians. Uh, the other, at that publication, I don't have the dates for that one for some reason, but I think that was early 1990s. I think they only continued until about 1994 or 95. And the reason I put the question mark there is because I'm sure that there were other communities um, in various states in New England who possibly had publications, but I'm not aware of them and I would really like to know about them if you happen to know of any that I don't know about. Now we're going to switch to publishers. So there were several publishers that were originating out of the New England area. New Victoria Publishers actually started as a printer. And you'll see over on the left-hand side there where it says New Victoria Printers. These were women, the four women, who had actually been working for a print shop up in New Hampshire. Uh, but the guy refused to give, they wanted a raise. They wanted better working conditions and so on and so forth. And he refused to give them a raise. And they said, well, we know what we're doing. And so they found a printing press and they started their own printing press, which was a lot of what happened in uh, feminist lesbian publishers around the country. It happened in Baltimore, it happened in Iowa, it happened in um, the Bay Area where women, lesbian words were not getting printed. And so women started their own printing presses. And New Victoria happens to be one of those examples of a feminist work collective that started as printers. This book from Lichen Publication was one of the first ones that they printed. Uh, I neglected to write down the year, but I think it was about 19, I wanna say 77 in that neighborhood. Um, well, it must be 1975 because they started publishing their own books in 75. So it must've been right around 74, 75 that they, published this, this one book. And then they became their own publishers after they started printing other people's stuff. They said, well, we'll start our own printing, our own publisher. And they printed a wide variety of items, poetry, history, humor, fiction, novels, mysteries. Stone and McTavish, some of you might be aware of. That was a big, um, in the day, a, a really popular mystery novel. Um, that came out at the time. I particularly like Found Goddesses because it talks about a lot of made-up goddesses, um, Asphalta being one of them, who I still pray to regularly. Hail Asphalta, full of grace, help me find a parking place. Um, so that's sort of a, a bit of humor in there. The next publisher I'm picking up is Persephone, which some of you might recognize many of these titles. They were this down where it says Persephone Press, a lesbian strategy, that was actually from a t-shirt. They printed that on a t-shirt that you could wear around. This Bridge Call My Back was eventually reprinted later on by Kitchen Table Women of Color Press. Zami was eventually reprinted by Crossing Press. But these were the early versions of, of these books. Um, and I, I these were some of the first ones I got my hands on. Uh, when I was coming out. And so they are very near and dear to my heart, this particular publisher. Um, and then there's other publishers around the New England area, not as well known and maybe not as many books. Um, the Timely Books is actually reprinted pulp novels. Paula Christian was writing uh, 
pulp novels back in the 1960s. That's a pseudonym. Her real name was Yvonne McManus. And she ultimately started publishing other books that were not lesbian in topics, but she, she published these books as pulp novels originally in the 60s. And then she herself created timely books and reprinted them again, all with these nondescript titles. The pulp novels had real pulp covers. Um, I don't unfortunately have any of those in the collection, but, um, but that's where that one came from. Astarte Shell did a lot of spiritual books. And then Mad Woman did some Nyad reprints. I'm not sure how many titles they ultimately published, but On My Honor um, about lesbians and scouting was one of their most popular books. And uh, Nancy Manahan, who was the editor of that book or the writer of that book has recently republished it in the year 2020. This next one is, um, I call her the Renegade. This is Giant Ass Publishing. Hothead Paisan, the author and the publisher is Diane DeMassa. And she did comic books. And it's sort of, it's, she called it the homicidal lesbian terrorist was her subtitle. Uh, and she, it was sort of like working out her anger at men and, and so on through these somewhat considered violent type fantasies of what she would do to men who are abusing women. Um, but she was had a good sense of humor. She was a really good cartoonist in many levels. And she kind of went all out with doing a button for herself. The giant ass publishing is the front of the t-shirt and crack a smile is the back of the t-shirt that she created. She also sold candy bars for a while. I happened this box is the Hothead Paisan Secret Stuff box. Actually was in a bookstore and it had candy bars in it. I think these were the crackle kind. She had several different kinds of candy bars for a while. The one with her with the bomb in the center, that's a Christmas card, <laughs> believe it or not. And then I worked with Diane for a while in the uh, book wholesaler where I was working for a period of time. And she, I was getting ready to move. And so she drew me this cartoon of me moving uh, from one place to another. So I, I got a big kick out of that. She was um, pretty good at, at showing me always with blank glasses. And there was another picture she drew of me that had a t-shirt on it that said slaughter department, which I didn't really quite get what that was about. But anyway, so, so Diane was, was kind of a, a lot of fun. Um, so the next moving on, if you're having publishers and books and newspapers and uh, periodicals, you have to have a place to distribute them. So along come the feminist bookstores. And New England had quite a few of them uh, that were really quite important. Many of you might remember New Words, which was up in Cambridge from 74 to 2002. These are some of their early bookmarks um, and a postcard that they had, somebody had drawn for them, the, the New Words postcard. And then this photo is of some child sitting in New Words um, reading Wonder Woman. So New Words was a very important place in that community for a long time. Uh, Golden Thread Booksellers was located in New Haven. The first owner had this logo with the cat on it. This was a books uh, a bookmark uh, from from that time that she owned the store. I think she owned it until night. She owned it for six years, like between 1982 to 88. And then the new owner changed the logo and had a different rebranded the store um, and took it to a new location. And she had, she sponsored softball teams. So this actually is a softball uh, shirt from the softball team that um, she sponsored during the years that she was the owner. And I don't exactly know when, the owner of the store was a friend of mine and she doesn't exactly remember when she closed it. So that's why I said, I'm not sure of the dates. And then there were plenty of other feminist le women's lesbian bookstores around the New England area. Uh, Reader's Feast was also um, a restaurant or a cafe. Women Crafts is still going on in Provincetown. They have been there since 1976, although I think they've changed locations a couple of times and they've changed their t-shirt design a couple of times. This is a really old version of their t-shirt. Uh, Visions and Voices was in Providence, and that one was very short-lived. They didn't really last very long. 
Lunaria, unfortunately, that's the only thing in this PowerPoint that I have no, I have nothing from Lunaria except the knowledge that they existed as a feminist women's bookstore for a long time in Northampton. And then Woman Fire also was in Northampton. I'm not entirely sure when they um, stopped. Uh, I think around 1987, because I think that's when Lunaria started. So they, they kind of bridged each other a little bit uh, there. And then one of my favorite places in the world is Bloodroot, a feminist vegetarian restaurant and bookstore located in Bridgeport. They just celebrated their 48th anniversary just yesterday, actually. They always celebrate their anniversary on the spring equinox, um, usually with a big party. But not only are, were they a restaurant and bookstore, but they also, so the, the shirt on the, the, the drawing on the left is from a t-shirt that they had. They also had what was called the GNAP Historical Society. And what was important about that was that it was always met on Wednesday evenings. Because they were a public restaurant, of course, anybody could go eat in the restaurant, but they, were le they are lesbians and wanted to support women's only space when they could. So they created the GNAP Historical Society that met on Wednesday evenings from seven o'clock to nine o'clock and only women could come in the restaurant. You had to be a member of the GNAP Historical Society in order to come into the restaurant. And sometimes it was a struggle. Um, I have a membership card for them too for some, from some place, but I don't, I seem to have mislaid it someplace. But they would do concerts and they would do this, this witch, the wild and independent thinking crones and hags was a lecture series that they did. Uh, Noli was, uh, is still, a photographer. So that's a picture that she took of the eggplants. They're making baba ganoush with the eggplants all steaming there on the stove. And then uh, Selma, who was also one of the cooperative owners, was really good at fabric arts. And so she created this mermaid quilt, the tessellated mermaid quilt. Um, and that's a postcard photograph of it. it that hung in the restaurant many years. Um, and I think it's still there somewhere hanging from the rafters. But not only were they a bookstore restaurant, but they also published their own cookbooks. Uh, so these are three of the books that they had published under the name Sanguinaria. So moving on from bookstores and whatnot, let's go to music for a little bit, talk about some of the, the fun things that we had with music. So these were many of the uh, musicians who, um, lived in the New England area or who mostly performed here. The one that's the black and white one sort of in the center is called Mountain Moving Day and it's hard to read, but that's one of the earliest albums um, that came out that's from the New Haven Women's Liberation Rock Band and also from the Chicago Women's Rock Band. That one came out in 1972. Uh, so that's one of the oldest bits here. Um, Kay Gardner um, was one of the few musicians who did um, orchestral music to some extent. The Rainbow Path is an extraordinary piece of music that is for full orchestra. Uh, she played the flute, her, flute herself. She was a composer um, and she did a lot of backup. You might have heard her playing on the back of some of Alex Dobkin's tunes. Um, Maxine and Linda, Maxine Feldman and Linda Shear, those are the only albums they ever did. Uh, and Linda was very quite adamant that a lesbian portrait should be lesbian music for lesbians only, and she would not allow anyone to play it on the radio. Um, I think over time that sort of relaxed, but um, she was pretty much pretty adamant that it, only lesbians should listen to her music. Uh, she played the piano, and I think that's a piano that she reconstructed herself that she's sitting in front of there. Um, but these are some of the other performers that are, were from New England, as well as these works as well. Sister Love, this was the only album they did. Um, and, and that one was from 1987. Uh, Lilith is also a really old time one. That one's from 1978, that album. Uh, many of you might recognize Tracy Chapman. I, I don't know that she still lives in the New England area, but she was in Boston area when she put this album out. So that's why she gets put into New England here. Alison Farrell is still performing, as far as I know. Laura Wetzler uh, was originally from Brooklyn, uh, does a lot of traditional Jewish music, as well as her own writing, but she now lives in Northampton. So I've 
brought her in as a New England representative. Uh, so then the next thing that many of you might be aware of is the New England Women's Music Retreat that happened from 1981 to 1991, 1999. And I, when it first came out, it was New England. And so it was hard to switch to calling it the Northeast Women's Music Retreat. But partly that happened because even though it started in the New England, Connecticut area. They started having some of the festivals in New York. And so I think that's one of the reasons why it branched out to Northeast. Um, but Kathy, uh, Kathy is the donor of, of many of the, these things. And I like telling the story of, if you look at the t-shirts on the left. So the first one says 1981, and you'll notice that there's one woman in the mountain. The second one is from 1982, and you'll notice that there's two women in the mountain. And if you look at the third one, that's from 1983, and there's three women in the mountain. And once they got to that point, they said, we're keep having festivals, but we're not gonna put any more women in the mountain. So from then on, there were only three women in the mountain on their t-shirts. Um, but the files that you see there are files that have a lot of the program books, the announcements of the festivals, it has a lot of material about the craftswomen who, um, brought their wares to the festival. And then that sign crafts unload area, I have several um, signs that were given to Wander Ground that were from the crafts area. So that's an actual board with paint on it that was hammered up at a few places around the festivals year after year. Uh, so, and then there were other music venues around town. Um, the Hartford, Hartford, Connecticut had a women's coffee house for a while. Um, this one that says concert for women um, proceeds the women's Pentagon action. There were a lot of performers who did a lot of performing at various um, activist events, peace, peace events, stop the trident events, feminist events, um, take back the night, so on and so forth. All of those were places that lesbian musicians in New England were performing. Um, I circled the candlelight bar there at Forbes Avenue in New Hampshire. That was a bar that uh, we performed in, a group of us, uh, to do um, to raise money for the Women's Pentagon Action. And that was one of the few times we all came out that night. There were a couple of guys who were causing trouble. Um, and we went out after the concert and found out that our tires had all been slashed. Um, that was back in 1981. Uh, PM by the Sea is a lot of fun too. These were gals who would invite musicians to come and they'd go down to the beach at uh, in Sandwich on the Cape and build a bonfire and we'd sit around and sing around the bonfire. So that was a lot of fun. And then the Expanding Horizons Coffee House uh, happened, uh, was produced by Mary Devereaux and some other folks. And so they, those came out, I don't know, once or Every couple of months, I think they did featured mostly local performers. Um, so it was basically a, a, a relaxing evening of whoever was performing that particular night. PM by the Sea also sponsored um, Kate Gardner up at the Cape Cod Community College one time. So moving forward, let's talk about some activisms. Um, this is Audra Lord. Many of you may recognize her. And the Combahee River Collective statement, the, and they, they say it different ways. And even I heard an interview with Barbara Smith and she was in the collective and she doesn't even remember how they said it, but I think it's Combahee. And they were a radical feminist, black feminist organizing group. Um, did a lot of, this is a pamphlet of theirs that actually, even though the collective existed in Boston from 1974 to 1980, this particular pamphlet was printed by the Kitchen Table Women of Color Press, who actually were located in uh, New York. But they also did uh, I Am Your Sister conference, which happened in 1990, which was a celebration of the works of Audre Lorde. And all of the workshops and everything were based on some of the writing of Audre Lorde. This calendar has a lot of pictures and writings by Audre in it. Um, and part of the thing of the conference was that they really, and they didn't really call it a conference. You'll see it up there. It says, um, Sela Conference. So Global Sela Conference. And I think they were trying to say it was about celebration 
of Audra's work and her words, um, and also creating strategies uh, for the future. So this is a calendar and a bookmark that were from that. We also have a t-shirt in the collection um, from that um, gathering. Um, another group that was real active in the New Haven area was the Spinsters Opposed to Nuclear Genocide. Um, did various actions. Um, so these are the t-shirts, a couple of t-shirts, a postcard, other um, posters and, and political actions that happened. The emergency order curfew. Um, we decided that, you know, the violence against women was getting really um, impossible. And so this curfew statement, it's hard to read on this particular slide, but it says women are raped every three minutes. One of three women are women are raped in a lifetime. Violent crimes against women is increasing and women are effectively under curfew because they can't go out safely at night. And so we declare a curfew on all men over the age of 12 from 8 p.m. until 7 a.m. effective immediately. And we had those printed up posters to look very official and posted them all around downtown New Haven uh, one evening. So, um, and then the reason I put that little scrap of yarn there, um, you'll see a, the picture that has the, say, you can see the safety bin sort of, but one of the things at Spinster meetings is that we were always doing these little macrame things. We'd be sitting there talking and having these incredible conversations and just about everybody around the room was making little bracelets. And we decided as a group to make a bracelet and somehow or other it came into my hands and I didn't pass it on and that's how unfinished it was. But um, that was one of the things that we were always doing was making little bracelets. Uh, so some of the other organizations around that I'm aware of are the Rhode Island Women's Association that's still going on today. They meet, uh, I don't know, every month or two, have a dance or something. That's a social group. Um, Orioles, uh, because RIWA kept changing their um, age limit, the old lesbians in the group got really aggravated with that. So they started the organization of Rhode Island, older lesbian, the Orioles. They actually ceased meeting. They would go for lunch and whatnot, socializing, but they stopped meeting when COVID hit because they were not, and they, they haven't restarted themselves again. Um, Ole was out of Boston area, old lesbian energy, and the slap haps, senior lesbians at play happily, um, also started by Kathy and a friend of hers. Uh, and so these are just some photographs from some of the albums. What I have are from these organizations are their organizational papers, some minutes, some history, photo albums, uh, not a whole lot of stuff. They were donated by one or two uh, lesbians who were in those organizations. Not a complete set of anything, but at least a, a, a sampling of what they do and, and how they, what they're up to. And then finally, I just want to talk about some of the lesbians that we love. These are lesbians whose items are in the um, collection that we have at Wanderground. Kate Russian is a poet. She's living still in Connecticut, but she has a couple of poetry books and she had been one of the co-owners of New Words for a while. She's the one who wrote the bridge poem that's featured in this bridge called My Back. Mary Daly, many of you may know, several books from her, radical lesbian feminist thinker, philosopher. Carolyn Gage, who is a playwright, who's still very active writing plays and producing. She lives up in Northern Maine. Um, does a lot of work with her plays. Some of them are in print. Julia Penelope, who uh, created a game that's called Dyke, the Dyke Game. Do you know enough? It's a trivial pursuit game with hundreds of cards, with hundreds of questions, all pertaining to lesbian history. Pam Smith was a DJ. It was doing doing the Amazon radio show in um, New in Bridgeport. They they aired out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Diana Davies. Um, photographer, and Angela Bowen, who lived in the Northeast for a long time in the New England, Boston, and Connecticut area, and eventually moved out um, to the West Coast. And then uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what we have here in the collection. I just wanted to give you a taste, uh, but there's plenty more in the uh, um, archives to explore. Jewelry, videos, art, photos, fabrics, greeting cards, posters, banners, letters, personal papers, and all kinds of other things. Um, 
this is a hand knit hat that's got labrises on it. I have three of them in different colors. I have no idea who made them. They were given to me. Um, they're quite warm and comfy. Um, and then this goddess cookie cutter, uh, which was made by a lesbian metalsmith who lives here in the Rhode Island area. And so this also is to encourage you as you are going through your items and you wonder if you have things to contribute to the archive. I just want to say it's not only about books and pamphlets and so on, but anything that you have that's flyers or posters or letters or journals or diaries or any of the I have diaries isn't even on this list, but the, we have some diaries as well. Um, so that's another thing that we want to encourage you to save and think about maybe sending to War Underground at some point. Um, we have a lot of events coming up during Lesbian Visibility Month. Lesbian Visibility Day is Friday, April 26th, but we decided to make a whole month of it. Um, and so you can find these events up on our website if you happen to be in New Hanover, New Hampshire, or Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or New Haven, Connecticut. Or even if you're in Cranston, come to the library and see our exhibit. And now I'm going to turn this off and make myself quiet and listen to all the wonderful things that you have to add or share or ask about or stories to tell or anything that you remember of anything that um, I talked about.